Hi, Genies. It's Fisher. Before we get started, just a quick thank you for getting Extreme Genes to where it is today. We're on radio stations all over America, and our podcast is growing exponentially. I'm often asked, what can I do to support Extreme Genes? Well, that's easy. Become a part of our Extreme Genes Facebook community and like our page. Share the podcast with your friends. Follow us on Twitter. And most importantly, support our sponsors through links on our website. They're the best in the business. Thanks again. Now let's get on to this week's podcast. Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people People have been learning about their ancestors from kings to thieves inventors to farmers nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore but it always does find out what we mean great family history stories and information are on the way now with extreme genes family history radio and extremegenes.com it's been this way for generations Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. Uh oh. And you have found us, Extreme Genes, America's family history show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and. Watch the nuts fall out. Well, hopefully you had a fantastic Thanksgiving. You are on the treadmill and just getting ready for the next run at Christmas time. We have got a show for you today. I'm very excited about it. Of course, it's our monthly DNA show. And we have Dr. Robin Smith on from 23andMe talking about what's going on with them because there have been a lot of changes lately on their reports. And it'll be really interesting to hear what they've got going. Plus, later in the show, very excited to have... Olympic speed skating champion Apollo Anton Ono on for a segment. And Apollo has been digging into his past, trying to figure out some of his background. And you'll be interested in hearing what the journey's been all about for him. It's going to be a great segment later in the show. So hope you'll be here for that. But right now, let us check in with Boston and our good friend, the chief genealogist for the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, David Allen Lambert. Hello, David. Greetings from Dean town and not far from the first Thanksgiving. That is true. That is true. I, I'm feeling fat. I, I really am. A little too much pie, but uh, I am hitting the gym. I'm taking good care of myself. Well, that's good. You know, I always find that if you're going to go run on the treadmill, you might as well have a piece of mincemeat pie or something to lead you on to <laughs> yes. get that extra mile in. It is a quality of life thing. That it truly is. I want to share a little story with you that a lot of people didn't know. The first leftovers actually probably occurred during the first Thanksgiving. And really? I'll explain. Yeah, back in 1841, Alexander Young published a book in Boston containing a letter from Pilgrim Edward Winslow, and it goes on to say the following. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, that we might, after more, a special manner rejoice together. There were many of the Indians coming amongst us, and among the rest of the greatest King Massasoit, with some 90 men, for whom three days we entertained and feasted. Basically... What you're caring about is a Thanksgiving that lasted for days. Well, isn't that kind of what our leftovers are? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I hadn't thought it of it really that is. way. You are correct, sir. And I don't know if they brought home doggy bags uh, <laughs> from the first Thanksgiving. I don't know that they had a lot of dogs back there. They did. I mean, hopefully they weren't part of the first feast. Right. Uh, <laughs> But sharing things doesn't always have to be from humans. Apparently, if you're a pigeon, you've heard the term pigeonhole and putting things away. Well, in Russia, in a Catholic cathedral, in the Cathedral of Assumption in Zengorod, 40 miles west of Moscow, they have found scraps of paper that have been put away from nests from birds since the 19th century. What? Yeah, it's like a little mini archives. Of course, you know, birds will scroll away any piece of straw or a string and whatnot and build a nest to keep their chicks warm. In this roof that they were redoing in this 15th century cathedral, they found 
fragments of letters dating back to the 1830s, records <laughs> uh, that are written in calligraphy from the 1820s, the 50s. And these are all torn apart by birds, but enough that they can get little fragments of them, including part of a calendar bearing the date of December 6, 1917, with a note that Emperor II, the last hour of Russia, had been executed. Whoa. Do you think pigeons are historians? I, Apparently I, so. I don't know. At least those I are. Guess. Well, I mean, the selective news stories of historical interest. I think family histoire news may have been done by pigeons at one point. <laughs> at one time, yes. <laughs> you know, I always love a touchstone of history. And, of course, for New Englanders, we never throw anything out. I think that the term hoarders comes from the New England attic. I think that's um, true. My great-grandfather was in the Canadian Expeditionary Forces in World War One. I. I have very few things that belong to him from his service, including a postcard and a couple of photographs. If I was there, I'd probably want to bring back some sort of a souvenir, you know, like maybe a German cannon. Right. Who well, wouldn't want one of those? Put it on your lawn, a captured German cannon. Well, you can get one. And I bought a small part of a German cannon on eBay this week for $10. <laughs> <laughs> During the Liberty War Bonds drive back in World War I, if you purchased a war bond for a certain amount of money, they gave you a token that was made from a piece of a German cannon captured Whoa, during the war. Really? So I now have a piece of a cannon that fits in my pocket, and it's a piece of an artifact that could have been, you know, cannon on a battlefield that my great grandfather was trying to attack. I mean, the idea. Who knows? A theory. Right. It's it's a great little piece of history. I have coal from the Titanic. I have wood from different <laughs> vessels. Constitution. So in my shoebox, I have my own Smithsonian. Very so it's, nice. It's fun. And I think for historians and people that are trying to get a touchstone, you know, if you pick up a rock from battlefield or something from where your ancestor served or where they lived or a piece of a brick from an old house or a cellar hole, it allows you to have that three-dimensional connection. And now for this piece of a German cannon, I have another piece of World War One history and not make my neighbors feel like I'm going to shoot at their home. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, my tech tip. As genealogists and historians, you've probably noticed you accumulate a lot of books. Well, do you ever notice that occasionally you buy duplicates or you get gifts of, oh, thanks, I already have that, and you end up regifting it? Right, yes. This is a perfect app called Library Thing. Library Thing is a free app that you can download from the iStore. You can basically download it. It has a barcode reader if you have a camera on your phone. You can scan in that barcode. It automatically finds the book and adds it to your catalog. Wow. You can then search by the title. <laughs> you can search by the author. Who needs a bookstore registry when you can have your own? What a great tip. Um, I love it. Another thing that's free, as you know, as always, for our guest users that sign up, we have two databases Essex County, Massachusetts, original probate records from 1635 to 1681, and birth, marriage, and death in German church duplicates from the 1790s to 1870s. Now, these are all databases that NEHDS at AmericanAncestors.org has done with a collaboration with FamilySearch, and we're very glad with that partnership. Talk to you next week, my friend. All right, buddy. Thanks for coming on. And coming up next, Dr. Robin Smith from 23andMe talks DNA on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show in three minutes. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. World, and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now MyHeritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. 
In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com, provide your saliva sample from home, and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Hi, Genies. It's Fisher. So excited to tell you about our very first Extreme Genes Family History Cruise, September 13th through 18th, 2016. We'll be leaving out of Boston on Royal Caribbean with stops in Bar Harbor, Maine, St. John, New Brunswick, and Halifax, Nova Scotia. On days we're at sea, join me and David Allen Lambert, Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, for lectures and roundtables on several genealogical topics. See where your patriot ancestors ancestors fought in the revolution or where your loyalist ancestors claimed their new homes for pricing go to our extreme genes facebook page or visit extremegenes.com now is the time to make your reservations because when the cabins are gone they're gone call robin at columbus travel at 1-800-373-3328 extension 1010 and be sure to ask her about our special pre-cruise excursion in boston david and i look forward to seeing you back extreme genes america's family history show and extremegenes.com it is fisher here your radio root sleuth with my guest dr robin smith from 23 and me and it's a first time having you on the show dr smith good to have you great to be here you have uh, uh, quite an interesting background coming in from canada and and you didn't really start out in the field of genetics what did you do yeah, it's been a pretty circuitous route. I started off studying uh, spinal cord regeneration for grad school, and then I really got into genetics a lot, and I did a, a, what's called a postdoc at the University of California, San Francisco. There I was studying how genes are turned on and turned off, primarily interested in how we respond to drugs and how development works, how our limbs grow, how our arms grow. And since joining 23andMe, I've been working on a variety of, of products. I've been primarily writing health reports, writing wellness reports, traits reports, and, and also on the Ancestry team. So I've been working a lot on the, the new uh, Neanderthal report, also on some of the tools we've been developing, for example, the Share and Compare tool. Let's go through some of these things a little bit at a time here. First of all, let's talk about the Neanderthal report. I, I actually had rather high numbers on that which may explain my yeah. forehead and, and extra facial hair. But <laughs> t- let's talk about that a little bit. Where, where does this come from? Where does this number generate from? And what is the normal range here? Yeah, well, you may know Neanderthals were a sort of sister species. They, they went extinct around 35,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago, but they were around a lot longer before that. And they were similar to humans in a lot of ways. They were a little bit broader around their torsos and had big brow ridges and whatnot. And at some point, they interbred with humans before going extinct. And so basically, most modern humans, present-day humans that are outside of Africa, have a signature of these Neanderthals in their genome. How much you have varies person to person. In the old report, I had around 3% Neanderthal. My mother was slightly higher in the new Neanderthal report, we've changed it up a little bit because there's been some new data coming out. So all this sequencing data has been published lately. And so now we're able to really pinpoint exactly where the Neanderthal ancestry is and show you exactly, um, you know, on chromosome one, chromosome two, exactly where to find it. We can also do something cool, which is basically trying to see whether those little bits of Neanderthal uh, ancestry are correlated with any traits. So for example, height, 
or back hair or various things like that. <laughs> so you can kind of look, go in and see whether you have any higher likelihood of having those things based on your Neanderthal ancestry. Oh, that's amazing. See, you made me feel a lot better because mine only came in in my 23andMe report at like 2.4%. So maybe okay, it wasn't yeah, quite as high low, as I yeah. thought. So let's talk about this because you're always coming up with new tools. Let's talk about the share and compare thing. Now, explain to our listeners exactly what it is that this does and why it's important to them. Well, so in the old 23andMe experience, the reports would basically give you your results, but they would give you all of your friends and relatives, like all of your shares uh, results as well. And it's not exactly how we wanted to do it, because if somebody had a lot of shares, then they would have a lot of results. So now in the new experience, basically what we've done is centralize all that information. So if you want to know anything about your relatives, your friends that you connected with, you can go to this one easy tool. And on the right-hand side, you've got all of the different reports that we offer. So care status, wellness traits, ancestry. You just click on that and you can see like in a pedigree view, so looking back to your parents and grandparents your, or your siblings, or just looking at your friends in general and see, you know, what are their results for those reports. And so you can see, for example, let's say you're 5% Italian. You can go back one generation and say, oh, your father is 10% Italian, and then go back one more generation and say, oh, your grandparent is 20% Italian. So you can do that for any of the reports. So it's quite a useful view for looking at how things are inherited. Do we all actually get those kind of exact numbers where, you know, you divide it in half with each generation coming down? Or is that just an example you were using? Because I, I'm aware that some people will show up with Greek ancestry when they're expecting Italian because their ancestors moved from Greece into Italy. Yeah, no, that's definitely a good point. That that was an example. And I think, you know, there are definitely some cases where you'll see that. But in other cases, it's not as simple as just a division. And when we're doing these, uh, we're looking at your ancestry composition, we're sort of looking at very large pieces of your genome and using a, a statistical algorithm to figure out what it's likely to be. But that said, there's a lot of variation in ancestry. You know, if you look at people in Italy, you know, if you look at people in Sicily versus northern Italy, there's a lot of variation. So it all comes down to the reference populations that we use, these data sets. And we're continuing to get more and more and, and make our algorithm better and better. And hopefully we'll get more and more resolution as we go forward. So when you mention the grandparents and the great-grandparents, do people actually need their tree on there to associate that with these results? Or does the report actually identify where this specific information came from? It definitely helps to have uh, some people connected, but we do have some tools. Let's say if you, you don't have people connected yet, we have this feature called inferences where in certain cases we can make predictions about what your parents or grandparents were likely to have had based on what your result is. And we, we can't do that for every single report, but for some of them we can. So talk about the sharing and comparing as far as the health traits go a little bit more. So if I find I've got a first cousin or a second cousin or even a third or fourth cousin that is on there, am, am I likely to see similar traits and then we can find exactly what ancestor we had in common, who to blame basically for a, a negative trait or something positive? Yeah, it kind of depends. Genetics is very complicated, obviously. There, there's some things where there's a single gene, you know, that's passed down from generation to generation, and that is very informative about a particular trait. So, for example, lactose intolerance. You could probably trace that back and figure out exactly who gave you those variants. However, you know, there's other traits such as dimples, of all things, where there are lots and lots of markers, lots and lots of positions in the genome that, that seem to affect those traits. So trying to trace it back to a particular ancestor is a little more tricky. Got it. And, of course, we don't want to blame any one person anyway because it could come from anywhere. It's true, yeah. <laughs> but it can be fun, you know, like trying to figure out. You know, I've heard lots of stories. Cece told a story about how the perfect pitch was passed down in her uh, family line. And I know there's a lot of stories like that. So I think it's up to customers to sort of fill in the gaps, what they know about their family history, what they can find with genetics. So let's talk about the future. Where are things going now? What can people expect down the line in terms of uh, the, the constant development? You're obviously privy to some things that may be happening down the line that are pretty exciting. What do you see in, say, a year, five years, ten years? I mean, I think you'll continue to see more reports from us, more tools, different ways to interact with your genome. There's a really good set of reports there right now. I think we're going to be continuing to work on enhancing those and trying to look at the literature and see what other scientists are finding and see how we can improve things. Do you think there will be a time where it's more like focusing a telescope as we look back and we talk about, say, the ethnic breakout? 
For instance, I had a friend whose grandfather was full Italian, but when he got the results back, it was very small. It was like 3% Italian. Will we reach the point where we can say, okay, he was at this place or your ancestors were in this place at this particular point in time and then moved? Will you be able to follow that, do you think? I think getting at particular ancestors, I mean, you can obviously do that with some of the haplogroups features, you know, like you can link those back to particular people, you know, Genghis Khan or Nile of the Nine Hostages. But when it comes to looking at the rest of your genome, the autosomal part of your genome, I think going back to particular ancestors is a little tricky. I mean, one thing I think that may be possible in the future is being able to get some time resolution on when a particular ancestry may have entered your line. So. Mm -hmm. You can sort of tell by how big, so I don't know how much you know about looking at chromosomes and segments and all that, but you can tell a lot based on how much of a particular ancestry you have, but also the pattern of the segments in, in your chromosome. So if they're really big, then they likely came uh, you know, relatively recently in, in, into your line, whereas if they're really small and choppy, they may have come further back. So you can kind of tell, for example, let's say you're 5% Italian, you, you might be able to tell based on the pattern of ancestry in your chromosomes, whether that is likely to have come in seven generations ago or two generations ago or three generations ago. It's fascinating stuff. It's a new experience for me. I had my results come in a few months ago, and I'm starting to interact with a lot of the other members on 23andMe, cousins and people who wanted to compare certain chromosomes, and I'm learning how that works. What are some of the questions that you hear most often, and what are the answers to those questions? Well, I mean, I do hear a lot about ancestry composition. So my wife is from Pakistan, and some of her ancestors are from around that region. In her line, there's some European ancestry, so I get a lot of questions from the family about, like, where did the European ancestry enter the line? And we sort of tried to figure out where that was, and the best we could find was that maybe it came about from Afghanistan, because there's been all this sort of gene flow into that area over the years. You know, Alexander was there way back when, the Greeks were there, all the, you know, there's been lots and lots of population movements in, in Central Asia over the years. And so the best we could think is maybe there's some ancestry in Afghanistan that looks like European, even though maybe it's not, you know, we wouldn't necessarily call it European today. So there's also some questions about Italian versus Northern African ancestry and trying to get at those differences. So I get a lot of questions around that, and I think it's really exciting to be able to sort of try to help people answer those questions. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. My wife came in with some North African ancestry, and I came in with some Iberian Peninsula and have no idea where that would have come in, especially at a percentage of 2 or 3% because it doesn't show up on my lines anywhere, but it must have just come down through someone. Yeah, I mean, that whole area is, there's obviously been a long history of moving across the Mediterranean, right? So figuring out exactly which population was part of your line is, I mean, I think that's where you can use 23 Me as a guide, but you also have to sort of fill in the gaps with what you know about your family. Right, as you've done your research and you continue moving forward. Dr. Robin Smith with 23andMe, I've enjoyed it, and we look forward to hearing more from what your research is showing and all the progress that you continue to make in this exciting realm and how it helps us with our family history. Great, yeah, it was great talking to you too. And, of course, we do a segment on DNA every month, so if you have a question, you can email me at fisher at extremegenes.com or drop me a note on Facebook, and we'll see if we can't get that question answered on the air, not only for you, but for everybody else who listens. And coming up next, he's a gold medalist and an NBC commentator, and he, too, is on a journey to find out about his background. We'll talk to Apollo Anton Ono, the speed skater, next in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. 
Stop by zapthegrandmagap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. And we are back. Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show on ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here with my very special guest, Olympic multiple gold silver medalist Apollo Ono in studio with me today. And uh, thanks for dropping by, Apollo. It's good to see you. Of course, of course. I love your guys' show and what you guys do. This is awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I was thinking about this. You're known around the world, but nobody can quite ever figure out what your background is. And obviously, you've got an interest in family history. I want to hear a little about what you've done and what you know. Sure. I'll break it down like this. I grew up in a single-parent household. My father was Japanese. He migrated to the United States when he was 18 years old, was married to my mom, and then they got a divorce when I was very young. My father took custody of me, so he raised me my entire life. So obviously, I'm very close to my father. I don't keep in contact with my mom. So I never developed the relationship with my mother in the sense of got to know her and her background. Right. And my mom was actually adopted. So oh, she, boy. Yeah. So she doesn't know her background and ethnicity because she doesn't know her parents. I mean, you can kind of tell based on the way they look, but because I don't keep in contact with my mom, I don't know. So when people ask me all the time, what's your background ethnicity? I say, well, I'm half Japanese. And they say, right. what's the other half? And I'm like, I don't really know. So not too long ago, I did the 23andMe genealogy test just right. to figure out kind of at least generally speaking what my history was. And then before that, I think there was this show called Who Do You Think You Are? Do right. You no, it's, it's still around. It's still going. Right? Oh, yeah. So, a friend of mine was producing the show. I would always told him, I was like, I really want to know what my background, at least on my one side, like maybe on the Japanese side, sure. like what does it look like, the tree? Because of the half Japanese heritage, what they did, you know, and, and the Japanese keep this very strict catalog, historical documentation of where the family and clans, I guess, are from, right? Back to the right. samurai. Yes. And uh, they started to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And they tried to, they had to get like approval from my grandmother the time my grandfather was alive and my father, and they were trying to just do all this research and using all these different translators, and they kept hitting a wall because they got to a point where the Japanese just didn't want to release the information. There was so much compliance and approval that my grandma was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> so uh, I, have the te I have the test results back from where I am, and it shows that the other portion of my of my heritage and ancestry is primarily it's northeastern European. Okay, kind of like there's some Irish there, there's like a little bit of like British, maybe some Scottish. One point six percent is North African, which I was like, wow, that's a big isn't that interesting when you yeah. get those trace elements? Yeah, those in trace there elements. Those people always say like. What's one thing that people don't know about you, Paulo? You know, and I'm like, I don't, I don't really know. I really, you know, I'm pretty open about my public, you know, like who I am. And then I started thinking the other day, I was like, I do a lot of reading about some pretty obscure off topic things. And one of them is like the origin of human species. I'm always interested in like, what was the first bones being excavated? What about this tribe? Where did we come from? You know, the other day I was reading about, you know, they found out this, they found this skull and some teeth in China. And they found that this kind of predates what they normally thought of any human beings being, you know, in, inside China. And they found that we know what their last kind of meals were based on their I was like, how do you, that is so crazy. <laughs> this guy eating like some dim sum. Like, yeah. this is incredible. It's like, fantastic. It, it's awesome. So really awesome. So did you get some stories out of Japan? 
about your uh, your parents, your I grandparents, did. your greats. What do you know? So I, on my grandmother's side, they found out that I actually have real samurai blood. No kidding. Real, uh, I forgot, the, it was the Yasunaga clan. It was something in, in Japan. Real samurai blood, and I, you know, I haven't done a lot of research into it. When did you find that out? At what point? I mean, you were probably that's still soon in... enough because I would have used that to my advantage out there, skating on these say, razor sharp blades and I'm... like feeling like I'm fierce. Yeah, know? that had yeah. to affect you. So it wasn't yeah. until after you'd retired. Well, I tell you, it's something interesting because my father didn't really play sports, my grandfather didn't really play sports, my grandmother didn't really play sports, and so I have this like really unique athletic ability. That was sort of an anomaly in my family, but there has to be some genetic heritage that is passed down through generations. We found that there's a, there's a relative in my family who was an exceptional runner, but never in a competition setting. But he would go visit his wife, and back then, you know, it was years and years and years ago, he would run to go see her. And it was like 16 miles one way or something Wow. Crazy. So he was like this incredible <laughs> endurance athlete. Well, you must have drawn something from yeah. him. And then, you know, perhaps from the samurai bloodline, maybe there's some fighter mentality there that is... You know, at least I like to think so. Absolutely. You know? So you yeah. found out about the samurais. How far back are we talking here? I don't know the exact date period, but it, it's pretty far back. I think we're going into like, you know, the 1400s, 1300s time. So this is pretty far back. And you did know? you get some of your tree back that far? Or, or? A little bit. It's bits and pieces and some of it's broken because they were not able to really connect properly given the approval inside Japan. So right, right. It's going to take, what it's going to take is it's going to take for me to fly to Japan with my grandmother, and then, like, basically just say, all right, Obachan, I need you to kind of agree to this, 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 this. So you need certain approvals from within the family. Every single step needs a no little kidding. approval. Yeah, it's very cumbersome. Wow. And so she was just like, why does he have to know? It doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking to Olympic hero and idol Apollo Ono about his family history background and some of his research. And you, you were saying you did the 23andMe DNA test, and... Since your mother's side was adopted, mm -hmm. what did, did you find any cousins, first of all? Did you find any connection with some folks who might be cousins to help you open up that adopted uh, side? Not yet. Not yet. But there's been like some, I think they give you like some suggestions, right, in terms of like who might possibly be related. I right. always wondered why my goatee and my sideburns were red. <laughs> because Japanese yeah. people have black hair. Yeah, that wouldn't be from there. And I'm like, this is, I'm either Irish or like Native American. Scottish. Yep. Scottish. Mm -hmm. Definitely something in the Northeastern European region. Sure. And it makes sense now. Well, a lot of people will do that. They'll suddenly find a first or second cousin pops up yeah. or, or even a third. Right. And then they can start coming down and to what you know about your mother and start putting this thing together, reconstructing the tree coming forward. And that's how that can get done. Yeah. But uh, yeah. you're going to have to be paying attention to your yeah. results in order to get that to well, happen. It, it takes, it basically, what it does, it takes work, right? So you have to kind of sit down and you yeah. have to be committed and, and, and really kind of see. Well, and on. like you say, you've got that natural curiosity about yeah. history and human factor. I mean, this is something you can do on the plane, yeah. on, on your handheld device. That's hand what I do, device. on the plane. I do on the plane, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, all over the place. So what are you doing now? So, you know, I, I, uh, I retired in 2010 from, from my pursuit of the Olympic Games. You miss it? Every day. I miss the Olympic space every single day. But I get a taste of it every couple of years when I go to the Olympic Games. You know, I'm, I, I'm an NBC correspondent for the Olympics. I will be in the Rio 2016 Olympic Games as a commentator. I'll be in the 2018 Games as a commentator. I'll be in the 2020 Games as a commentator, 22 and 24 and beyond. So that's what I do in relation to sports. Then I have my own serial entrepreneurial activities that I kind of focus sure. on. I do some you know, hosting and some acting based in Los Angeles. But those three are the main things that I really spend my time and, uh, and obviously the Special Olympics and other different types of organizations that I've become partners with and, and try to lend my time to. So Love the Special Olympics. Yeah, phenomenal. I remember the phenomenal. first time I was ever asked to host some event there. And I, and I went there, frankly, with kind of a bad attitude. Yeah. It was like it was a Saturday, and it's yeah. like, oh, I got to go host this other thing. Yeah. And I got down there, and it was the most fulfilling, yeah. heartwarming thing. And I drove home with just such a glow. Yeah. And, I, and I was thinking back about how I had felt coming down and how yeah. I felt. And I couldn't do enough of that stuff. Yeah for many years to come and yeah. it was just a joy to do it and i can see yeah. you, you feel the same way about it yeah it's you know it's it's, it's, it's a revelation a, you think it's a giving experience but you get so much in return and that's yes. what i try to tell people is look just try it just see what i'm talking about well, I, can't, I can't explain it to and you and the love the love is the so love. so genuine yes they're, yeah i mean the special olympics athletes are so incredibly special and they're just unique and uh, I, I love being part of the organization blessed to, to to be able to represent them and always kind of take part 
it's been a big part of my life. You know, I'm excited about it. Apollo Ono, yeah. thank you so much for your time and uh, good luck in your pursuit. Thank you. Thank you. Because so I much. know this is going to be something that's going to keep pulling you back, especially when you got all those samurais back there yelling at you, yeah. you know. <laughs> Learn more about us. Absolutely. Like. Well, don't athletes <laughs> ultimately use things like anything they anything can use they can. as a motivation, right? Yep. Yep. And Some kind of slight, like the Koreans did yep. with you. Yep. Right? Yeah, I, oh. was, I was their motivation. Yes, you were. <laughs> <laughs> their single song. Oh, man. Yeah. He's Olympic legend Apollo Ono on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. World, and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now my heritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Here it comes, the 6th Annual Roots Tech Conference in Salt Lake City, Utah, February 3rd through 6th, 2016, at the Salt Palace Convention Center. The conference, hosted by Family Search International, is the largest family history and technology conference in the world. This year's theme will be celebrating families across generations. It's the perfect place to be inspired to discover, preserve, and share family connections and stories across generations past, present, and future. At Roots Tech, you'll find some 200 engaging classes with experts from all over the world. Enjoy daily sessions with well-known keynote speakers and learn all about the new tools available to help you in your journey in the massive exhibition hall. Passes start at $29. For more information and to register, visit rootstech.org. Hope to see you February 3rd through 6th in Salt Lake City, Utah. Hey, welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, the radio root sleuth. That is Tom Perry over there. Hello. With his shining bald head in the lights. <laughs> and uh, he, is our, he is our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. How you doing, Tommy? Well, now that my secret's out, not very well. <laughs> well, we have uh, we have a question from somebody, and it seems to be a bit of a problem. This listener's been following all of our advice about recording and videoing and dealing with audio. Has been putting up pillows around rooms, and and yet he's still getting a problem with hum in his audio. So what do you say to that? Well, my suggestion is get a good external microphone because what's happening is you have a tape transport system in your mini DV camcorder and it's vibrating. It's causing different things to happen. And as a result, your microphone is picking up these vibrations 
And there's really nothing you can do about it because it's built into the camcorder. So you have these inherent noises. So he's done the right thing. He's got the room picked out. He's got the, the room all soundproofed. But it doesn't much matter if the camera is getting the vibration into the internal microphone. Exactly. He's reducing a lot of the problems. But just like anything, the weakest link is going to be your problem. In this situation, his weakest link is his internal microphone. So get a good external microphone, pick up a magazine like VideoMaker or go to VideoMaker.com and they have a lot of reviews, they have a lot of good articles of how to mic people to make sure you're doing it right. But when you get an external microphone, if you're shooting solo, you're not going to be able to hold your camcorder and the microphone unless you have a tripod. So what I suggest you do is go to bhphoto.com and get a good mount that you can put on your camcorder, but it has rubber cushion so it'll isolate your microphone from the vibration of your camera. And that's a real good way to do it. If you have a friend that can hold the microphone, make sure you get the right kind of microphone. If you're using what we call a shotgun, which is one of the best microphones because it's very, very directional, make sure your buddy's paying attention to what you're doing and paying attention to who's talking so they point it at the right person. So don't use a typical 13-year-old because they'll be out in Never Never Land and pointing it wrong. (laughs) Right. So what you want to do is make sure it's pointed at Grandma when they're talking, pointing at Grandpa when he's talking. If they're very close together, you can still use a shotgun mic, just be a little bit farther away. If you're going to mic them with like a table mic, then you're going to want something that's more omnidirectional where it'll pick up like two or three or four people sitting around a table or go to a PZM type microphone that actually uses the table as a sounding board. Now you'll think, well, how do I get this into my camcorder? I have never seen a camcorder that doesn't have a mic in, so just run the cables into your mic. And if you're going to use wireless, make sure you get a good system. In fact, generally you want to rent one unless you're going to be doing a lot of shooting because you can buy cheap wireless microphones and you're going to get exactly what you're buying, something cheap. You're going to pick up all kinds of sounds from refrigerators getting plugged in and all kinds of things that are going to cause noise. So you want to get away from that. And most important, make sure you have headphones on. Whether you're shooting with your iPhone, your Android, a nice camcorder, you always want to use headphones because you're going to hear things that otherwise your head is going to tell you, your brain is going to say, hey, Don't bother me with that, and it'll block it out, and you won't even know it's there. In fact, what I suggest a lot of people do is if you have, even if it's an old camcorder, set it up in the corner, set it on a wide shot, get a good external microphone, and just turn it on and let it run and set a timer on your iPhone and say, oh, 60 minutes, I need to change the tape. And let that just run. Use your iPhone or your Android to do little one-on-one interviews because you've always got that way what we call B-roll. So if something is bad, you're moving to Aunt Martha, you miss something, the camera that you have over in the corner that's shooting the whole room and you have a good omnidirectional microphone on it is going to pick up B-roll so you can cut to those things and that way you're not going to miss little Martha telling a little story that you missed. I love that suggestion. You're you're turning us all into Hollywood people here, Tom. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Just remember the awards, whether you're getting an Emmy or an Oscar, you mentioned that you heard it on Extreme Gene. Right. (laughs) All right, what do you have coming up in the next segment? Okay, in the next segment, we're going to talk about now that you've shot good audio with your video, we're going to show you how you can edit your audio and even make it sound better. All right, coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. 
When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. We are back. Final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Tom Perry is here with us, our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. Answering a listener question as uh, we're getting you ready for the holidays and the interviews you're inevitably going to do with some of your senior uh, family members, of course. And, Tom, we were talking about the audio, and and you've straightened out a lot of people on the importance of an external microphone to avoid the hum that you would get off of a camera. But what about the editing side of this? Okay, there's a lot of good things to do with editing, and there's a couple ways you can do this. Just because you shot really good interviews doesn't mean you always need the audio and video together. A lot of times, all you're really concerned about is the audio. The video isn't important. And so what I suggest you do is get a program, and you can just separate the audio from the video and make CDs, which are easier for people to carry around. You can make the MP3s. And one nice thing about separating the audio, it gives you the opportunity to do what we call sweetening in the industry, making it sound better. So if the camcorder that you had in the corner that got all these voices and there's a hum from the refrigerator for the air conditioning, you can't take blankets and throw it over Aunt Martha and Grandma and all these people (laughs) to get better audio. You know, they'll be very offended. So what you want to do is you want to get a good program like Adobe Audition is my favorite. It's wonderful. It gives you the opportunity to visually edit. Audio is one of the hardest things to edit. Video is so much easier to edit. You can actually see a picture. Okay, this is the pine tree. I want to edit after the pine tree. You move your little edit mark past the pine tree. When Aunt Martha says the word two and you want to edit after the word two, the word two doesn't stay up on your screen. So you can see, okay, I need to scrub just past this. You have to go back and forth to find where she says the word two. That's where Adobe Edition is great. It has color on the frequencies. And so when you're watching, you can say, oh, that's the end of the purple. So you can go back to the end of the purple. That's where I want to edit Aunt Martha out. For those that want to just do a one-off, don't want to get into some real heavy audio editing, if you have a Mac, you have GarageBand because it comes free with every Mac. You can do some pretty miraculous things in GarageBand where you can get rid of hums. And and basically everything, like we mentioned before, has a waveform to it. So you can go in and say, okay, I can see this little band that stays totally straight no matter what Aunt Martha's saying, whether she's excited or speaking low, this thing stays consistent. That's going to be your hum. That's going to be the thing that's causing the problem. So you can go in and isolate that, find out what frequency it is by looking at your levers and seeing where the noise is coming from. And then in something like GarageBand, almost like an eraser tool, you can go and erase that and take that out. Wow. So it makes it so much easier. And then when you play it back, it's going to sound like, wow, they did have the blankets over them and everything sounds wonderful. (laughs) Now you're saying that GarageBand comes with what? GarageBand comes free with Macs. When you buy a Macintosh, it comes with a GarageBand. And it's a great way to edit. There's a lot of PC stuff out there. I'm pretty much a Mac guy. Go to VideoMaker, like I mentioned in the first segment, and listen to some of their reports on audio and different programs they recommend. But Macs are the best way to edit. They're the easiest way to edit. If you have a PC, just see what they recommend. But I really like GarageBand because it's free, and Macs are easy to edit on. 
Adobe Audition is wonderful because it adds the visual part of editing in audio, which when I used to do music videos, that was always the hardest part to edit was the audio. Where now with Adobe Audition, you can see the colors and see, okay, I need to do this where the blue is. I need to get rid of the purple. I need to do something with the green and the red. And it makes it so much easier to edit. And once you do this, all your friends will think that there are such wonderful speakers. They're such wonderful interviewers <laughs> because they had a good editor that made them sound wonderful. It's just amazing. Just like you make me sound audible so people can actually listen to me. <laughs> well, if they were in the studio, they wouldn't stand it. Tom, thanks for coming in. I think we're putting a lot of ideas in people's heads that these things are things you can do at home and what treasures you can create. Thanks, Tom. Good to see you. Good to be here. Wow, that was a lot of show this week. Thank you so much to Dr. Robin Smith from 23andMe for coming on and talking about where we're going with this DNA thing. And also to Apollo Anton Ono, the Olympic gold medalist, silver medalist, bronze medalist, NBC commentator for coming in and talking about his amazing background and his journey to discover more about it. Talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Yeah.